<clears throat> Thank you very much, Sarah. I am always pleased to be here at the center uh, and particularly pleased to be here uh, facilitated by the Action Fund. Thank you very much. Um, please tell uh, John Potesta that uh, I thank him for his leadership uh, on this effort. Uh, and I had the opportunity to speak when he Stuckelberg before we came in. I appreciate her help. And I'm always pleased to be here with uh, my uh, good and dear friend, uh, Martin Frost, uh, former member of Congress, did an extraordinary job uh, in the Congress of the United States and uh, not only represented our country well, but represented Texas uh, very well. So, Martin, thank you for being here. America has faced its share of trying times, times when not just our economy, but our nation seemed in decline. But each time, with ingenuity, hard work, and our distinctly American optimism, we have built our way out and we've emerged stronger. No one doubts this is one of those testing times. But the question that will be in front of us in this fall's vote isn't where we are, it's where we go from here. It's a choice between two dramatically different directions. And our decision really comes down to three questions how far we've come, what remains to be done, and which party will keep moving us forward. First, how far have we come? Let's consider an alternate history, if you will. America is facing the worst economic crisis in a generation. Americans are losing almost 800,000 jobs per month. Over a quarter of personal wealth in America has been wiped out. Banks are afraid to lend. Businesses are forced into layoffs. And innovative startups can't start up. Foreclosures are devastating neighborhoods. The massive deficit left behind by President Bush makes responding to the crisis even more difficult. A new president and a Democratic Congress are struggling for solutions. But negotiations break down. Congress remains paralyzed. And in the end, we do nothing. As a result, the nonpartisan CBO tells us that we'd be looking at 2 million additional unemployed Americans. The economy would likely have continued to shrink instead of growing for three straight quarters. Retirement savings would have remained devastated. And the global recession would have become catastrophic. It was that bleak picture that led former Reagan economic advisor Martin Felstein to endorse substantial deficit spending, to pump life into the economy, saying, and I quote Martin Felstein, I don't think we have a choice. I know thinking about how much worse off we could have been in is not worth much comfort to anyone who is still struggling to find work. But any honest look at our economy has to come to, has to start with an honest conversation about the disaster we have to this point averted as a result of the actions we have taken. A mere year and a half ago, economists across the spectrum were talking in all seriousness about the risks of a second Great Depression. Instead, we've stabilized the financial system, injected demand into the economy, and created jobs. In fact, uh, almost as many jobs in the first uh, six months of this year as George Bush created in the eight years of his presidency, net. In fact, the private sector has added jobs for, as I said, six straight months. By comparison, it took more than two years after the end of the last recession for our economy to return to six consecutive months of job growth in the private sector. That progress started with vital investments, not just in our immediate recovery, but in the foundations of prosperity for years to come. We're rebuilding roads, railways, and bridges. That is our economy's backbone. We are using Build America bonds to help local governments invest in the infrastructure projects they need most. And we're investing in our children's future. We've kept teachers in the classroom and have helped more young Americans reach their goal of a college education. We're helping doctors and hospitals computerize medical records so patients can be treated even more effectively. 
We've funded clean energy technology that will help us save energy and become less dependent on foreign oil. Technology like a smart grid that will respond to changing energy needs in real time. Just as the Internet was created in America with the support of the federal government, Today, in partnership with the private sector, we're laying the groundwork for transformational technology that can shape our economy and create jobs for years to come. And for 98% of Americans, taxes are now lower than they were in any single year under President Bush. Despite Republicans' efforts to demonize those policies, they can't refute the nonpartisan analysis that shows that they have been responsible for as many as three million jobs. They can't ignore uh, those investments benefits in their own communities, not when the House Minority Whip himself has hosted three job fairs, ironically, featuring employers who have benefited from such federal funds, a policy he voted against. In fact, while all House Republicans voted against these investments, more than half of the Republicans in Congress have taken credit for them in their districts. President Obama has also signed into law the HIRE Act, which cuts employers' taxes for every unemployed worker hired back. The Treasury De Department has reported that between February and May, the HIRE Act gave small businesses $8.5 billion in tax cuts for millions of new workers. Democrats have also passed legislation helping to support $28 billion in new lending for small businesses. Uh, we hope to, to do another uh, 30, which would leverage into 300. Unfortunately, uh, Senate Republicans don't see it that way. Uh, we've protected Americans uh, from abusive credit card lending practices, making the biggest investment in student lending in history without adding to the deficit. Health insurance reform will have an important jobs impact as well. A Harvard-USC study found that the health reform will create up to 4 million jobs over the next decade because it makes coverage more affordable for businesses and the self-employed while putting American companies on a more even playing field with their foreign competitors. And it will free the next generation of American entrepreneurs to innovate and make business decisions on the grounds of opportunity not on the grounds of keeping their health care coverage. Finally, President Obama has just signed important legislation to put the referees back on the field and hold Wall Street accountable for the reckless conduct that helped crash our economy. Wall Street reform will create an important new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and make sure that borrowers and lenders live up to the common sense standards of responsibility and honesty. It ends TARP and it ensures that the cost of any future financial crisis will be borne by the financial industry, keeping taxpayers off the hook for future bailouts, which, by the way, were requested by President Bush, Secretary Paulson, and Ben Bernanke. Wall Street reform will remove an important source of economic uncertainty, helping to free up the $1.8 trillion in cash sitting on the sidelines in corporate America as we speak. That is private sector cash poised to be redeployed into job-creating investments, the kind of investments that led to the chip and the tech boom in the 90s. The more we strengthen the integrity and transparency of our financial system, the more we rebuild the confidence needed to encourage investment in America, and the more our financial system gets back towards its core purpose, helping allocate capital to families investing in their future and entrepreneurs investing in job creation. All of those policies have a common thread. After a lost decade, middle-class Americans now have a Congress and administration that is helping it make up lost ground and building for future prosperity. All of that work, all of that work has helped move our economy back toward strength, though far too many people that is still not their reality. With millions of Americans still out of work, no one claims that we have reached success. And therefore, neither the Congress nor the administration can rest. So the second question becomes, what remains to be done?
Democrats are fighting for middle class Republicans as much as they want to use the economy as a political weapon are looking to go back to the very same policies that caused many of the problems the middle class confronts today. In fact, the chairman of the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee, uh, whose job it is to recruit uh, members to come to Congress to make policy, said, and I quote, we need to go back to the exact same agenda, meaning, of course, the Bush agenda of the 2000s, which have left us in the deepest economic recession we have seen in three quarters of a century. By all, almost all indications, it was an agenda that failed. That is the agenda to which the chairman of the campaign committee says the Republicans want to return. Democrats, on the other hand, are putting forward new ideas to drive our recovery, particularly when it comes to our vital manufacturing sector. That's why House Democrats are launching the Make It in America agenda, a strategy to, to boost American manufacturing. For generations, for generations, Americans have looked at our manufacturing sector as a source of economic vitality, a source of good-paying jobs, and a source of pride. America has always been proud to be a country that makes things, somewhere that those jobs and that pride are a thing of the past. But Democrats don't believe that, and we are committed to regaining America's manufacturing edge. The Make It in America agenda will include bills to encourage investments in industry, improve manufacturing infrastructure and innovation, strengthen the American workforce, and create a level playing field for American manufacturers that compete worldwide in this flat world of which Tom Friedman spoke. The Make It in America agenda is made up of a range of bills that we'll bring to the floor in the coming weeks, including U.S. Manufacturing Enhancement Act, which passed the House on Wednesday, and which makes it easier for American companies to get the materials they need to manufacture goods here. The Sectors Act, uh, which also passed the House this week and which forms partnerships between businesses, unions, and educators to train workers for some of the most needed 21st century jobs. The National Manufacturing Strategy Act, which will direct the President to develop a manufacturing strategy for the nation every four years. The end, the end the Trade Deficit Now Act, which will lead to the development of policies to reduce the trade deficit. And the Clean Energy, Technology, Manufacturing, and Export Assistance Act, which will ensure that clean energy technology firms have the information and the assistance they need to compete at home and abroad. The Ways and Means Committee uh, will also be holding hearings uh, next month, uh, actually uh, in September, uh, on the issue of uh, China's currency policy, uh, legislation introduced by Tim Ryan. These bills, of course, are just a start. And this is not an agenda just for the balance of this year. This is an agenda for the long term. There is more to come, and many House Democrats are coming forward with ideas that can contribute to a manufacturing revival. Let me also say that we welcome ideas from our Republican colleagues and indeed for the American public, uh, particularly the manufacturing sector itself. All of these efforts will bolster, bolster President Obama's plan to support 2 million more jobs by doubling U.S. exports in five years, a plan that is already showing success with exports up significantly over last year. And they will build on the impact we've already had since the beginning of this year. Our private sector has actually created 136,000 new manufacturing jobs. I hope the Republicans, as I said, uh, will join us uh, in working towards strengthening, expanding, and growing our manufacturing sector. I'm glad that many of them supported the Manufacturing Enhancement Act and the Sectors Act in the House. Uh, there seemed to be some reluctance, but uh, ultimately they reconsidered those no votes and turned to yes. I'm glad that uh, uh, we are seeing some bipartisanship in this Make It in America agenda. But the fact remains that Republicans have an 18-month pattern, pattern of standing with near unanimity 
against every measure to create jobs for working Americans. A wide range of job creating ideas are waiting to be enacted, but they continue to face partisan obstruction. Even though many of those ideas have won strong bipartisan support in the past. For instance, uh, we would help business develop and bring to market new technologies to increase productivity. We would further invest in science, technology, engineering, and math education. We would encourage entrepreneurship and investment by letting businesses deduct startups expenses and exempting small business capital gains from taxation. We would establish a new fund without increasing the deficit to help community banks lend to small businesses because 45 percent of small businesses seeking loans were turned down last year. We would extend as well the R&D credit. We would also end tax breaks that encourage corporations uh, to outsource American jobs overseas. Republicans, unfortunately, are fighting to keep that loophole open. Democrats want to close it and keep more jobs here in America. Republican obstruction has been even extended to unemployment insurance, as is so well known by the American public, a time when there are still five applicants uh, for each new job opening Unemployment insurance is one of the most effective ways of stimulating demand because, of course, it is quickly spent because it is essentially needed. Moody'sEconomy.com found that it produces uh, $1.63 economic st stimulus for every dollar that we spend. Republicans claim that we can't afford $34 billion for the unemployed, but then in the same breath they demand $676 billion in debt finance tax cuts uh, for the most privileged among us. I'm pleased that uh, uh, President Obama was able to sign the unemployment bill that we passed uh, yesterday. Uh, that money will be coming into the economy. But it also, from a moral standpoint, it will provide sustenance for families in deep distress still in this economy. Now, take this M MSNBC analysis of Congressman Pete Session and Senator Cornyn on Meet the Press just last weekend. Quote, both Sessions and Cornyn were unable or unwilling to discuss what Republicans would specifically do on the deficit. When NBC's David Gregory demanded specifics and details of painful choices, Republicans were willing to make uh, none. Sessions didn't offer a single one. That's the same thinking, frankly, that condoned record foreign borrowing, borrowing under President Bush and did severe harm to our long-term prosperity. Democrats understand that short-term deficits have been necessary for our recovery and, in my view, continue to be necessary. Uh, if we're going to bring this economy back, we will never, as I said in a speech just a few weeks ago, solve the deficit problem if we don't solve building and growing the economy challenge. For the same reason, the House will extend middle class tax cuts for the next year, though we expect the Senate to act first, as Speaker Pelosi said yesterday. All of the job creation measures I've discussed, along with those middle class tax cuts, represent only a small fraction of our real long-term deficit problem. We do have hard choices, hard choices to make about our fiscal future and I've spoken about them, as I said, a few weeks ago in detail. But in making those choices, we have to steer between two grave mistakes. One would be following Republicans who want to use our structural deficit as an excuse to put brakes on recovery, while millions are still unemployed. That would put even more Americans out of work and actually increase deficits we are trying to reduce. Another mistake would be putting ourselves even deeper into debt by t making tax cuts uh, for the wealthy permanent. Republicans seem to be able to hold both of these positions at the same time. A combination of reckless borrowing and middle class neglect that frankly characterized the previous administration. That brings us, of course, to the last question. We pulled our country off the edge of disaster. We know what needs to be done for the Americans who are still struggling. And finally, therefore, the question becomes, which party can you trust to do that? We know what Republican economic philosophy looks like in practice. Cut taxes, 
for the wealthiest, gut regulations that guard against everything from Wall Street excess to oil companies' negligence. And we know the record those policies generated when Republicans had unchecked chance to implement just a few short years ago. They drove our economy into the ditch, the deepest ditch we've been in in three quarters of a century. They created a decade of stagnant incomes. And during the eight years of the Bush administration, as I've said, the worst job record since Herbert Hoover. A stark contrast with the Clinton administration that created 21 million private sector jobs in 96 months, as opposed to the net 1 million jobs uh, created during the 96 months of the Bush administration. Over eight years of President uh, Bush, our economy added just a million private sector jobs. And it was President Bush who ran a $2.13 trillion in deficits and wiped out the biggest surpluses in American history, an inheritance of $5.6 trillion, a national debt of some $5-plus trillion turned into a national debt of $10-plus trillion. That record isn't an aberration, however. A decade after decade, Democrats have simply performed better on the economy than Republicans. Some may be surprised to hear that. Market analyst, analyst Larry Greenberg studied administrations from John Kennedy to George Bush and found that, and I quote, jobs grew more slowly for each of the Republicans uh, than for any of the Democrats. Princeton political scientist Larry Bartels studied income growth during administrations from Harry Truman to George W. Bush, and he found that, to quote a summary of his work, quote, when a Republican president is in power, people at the top of the income distribution experience much larger real income gains than those at the bottom. By contrast, he said, Democratic presidents generate higher income gains for all income groups. And in 2008, the New York Times asked this question, and I think this is such a compelling comparison. Imagine that, starting in 1929, you had to invest exclusively under either Democratic or Republican administrations. How would you have fared? Now, you make your choice in your head right now. Now, you're probably not surprised at what the conclusion was. Under Republican administrations, your $10,000 invested exclusively in Republican administrations, if you include the Hoover administration, would have netted you today $11,733. But that's probably not fair. So let's take out the Hoover administration, uh, which was arguably the worst. So let's take that out in all fairness. And if we're charitable, uh, and take that out, then your 10,000 investment exclusively during the course of Republican administrations over the last 70 years would have resulted in $51,211. Now, I don't know how good you think that is of a return over 70 years. Uh, under Democratic administrations, if you'd taken that same $10,000 and invested it exclusively under Democratic administrations, uh, that $10,000 would now be worth $300,671. Said another way, 600% more than if you had exclusively had that money grow under Republican administrations. So when we talk about Republican economic failure, we aren't talking about a passing trend. Notwithstanding the fact that I can point out to you that uh, uh, during the course of the Clinton administration, the Dow grew 226 percent, the S&P uh, grew by about 290 percent, and the NASDAQ grew uh, by almost 300 percent. Those same statistics are all negative during the Bush administration. From decade to decade and today, Democratic policies have supported innovation, the interest of working people, and a better standard of living for all Americans. Republican policies have objectively favored the privileged and left working Americans behind. We might be able to write off that record if Republicans gave any indication 
that they've reconsidered the policies they created, that created it. But again, as they put it themselves, quote, we need to go back to the exact same agenda. I don't think Americans had that in mind in 06, 08, and I don't think they have that in mind in 10. And when you remember that Republican behavior over the past months, uh, that uh, going back to the agenda makes perfect sense. Apologizing to BP when Democrats held it accountable for its disaster in the Gulf. Comparing the economic crisis to the size of an ant, as Leader Boehner did. Working with bankers and lobbyists to water down Wall Street reform, and then cynically portraying it as a bailout. Putting debt finance tax cuts for millionaires ahead of the unemployed. I am proud to put our party's middle class record against theirs any day but our work is not done. We've stood up to Wall Street, brought access to affordable health care to all Americans, reinstated pay-as-you-go and fiscal discipline, and gone to bat for job creation in the face of ideological opposition again and again and again for the last 18 months. Democrats can tell working Americans with confidence and with pride, we have stood for your interests, and we have met crisis with the optimism that defines our country. And it's best and can, at its best and can make a great nation even greater. So often, our biggest leaps have come out of the darkest moments. As President Obama said, and I quote, in the midst of civil war, we laid railroad tracks from one coast to another. And a twilight struggle for freedom led to a nation of highways, an American on the moon, and an explosion of technology that shapes the world to this day. And today, if we choose shared growth over spoils for a few and our common interest over the special interest, then this too can be one of those remarkable moments in which we build our way out. We will make it in America once again. Thank you very much.